Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to him on the ten-stringed lyre. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. The Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the hearts of all who considers everything they do. No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its great strength, it cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love, to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Good morning and welcome to our studies in the book of Psalms called Songs of a Heart Set Free. Last week we looked at Psalm 32, and the very last words that we read set the stage for what we are looking at today. In verse 11 of Psalm 32 it says, Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. Today we come to Psalm 33, which continues that thought and answers the question, Why praise God? And for the purposes of our discussion today, we will use the following outline. We begin with an introduction, praise the Lord, in verses 1, 2, and 3. Then we get into the actual content of reasons why we should praise the Lord. First of all, we praise the Lord for his word in verses 4 to 7. We praise the Lord, secondly, for his plan in verse 8 to 11. We praise the Lord for his people in verse 12 to 15. And fourthly, we praise the Lord for his care in verse 16 to 19. That is followed by a conclusion, hope in him, in verses 20 to 22. First, let's look at the introduction in verse 1 to 3. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. 
Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to him on the ten-stringed lyre. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. For the first time in the book of Psalms, in the text of the Psalms themselves, we have reference made to musical instruments in verse 2. First of all, the harp, represented by the Hebrew word kinor. The kinor is David's instrument. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 23, it says that whenever the Spirit from God came upon Saul, that is, this was an evil spirit that came from God to torment Saul, David would take his harp and play, and then relief would come to Saul. He would feel better, and the evil spirit would leave him. David was skilled at playing the harp, the kinor. David was skilled at playing the harp. Although we have no physical examples of the ancient Kenor of David's time in existence um, that have been uncovered, we have a pretty good idea of what it would look like. And uh, it's, it's actually, it's obviously it's a stringed instrument and the predecessor to many instruments that are still in use today. The word Kenor is the word that uh, Israeli people use to describe the violin. That's not to say that the kinor of David's time was a violin. No, it's just that the word is now used to describe that particular musical instrument. Now, in the Septuagint version of Psalm 33, the word translated uh, from kinor in Hebrew to the Greek language, kitara, is now used in modern Greek to describe guitars. A guitar is a, is a more recent instrument, but it's it's got a history. It's related to these earlier instruments in that the invention led to development. And, and so over the years, there were changes made and improvements made. And so what you have now is a, a musical instrument that has a link back to what David talks about in Psalm 33 when he describes a harp and the ten-stringed lyre. Harps are also mentioned in the New Testament and especially, uh, mostly in, in the book of Revelation, there's mention of uh, three times of harps. And uh, in chapter 5, verse 8, there is this scene in heaven where the lamb who was slain takes the scroll from the person, from God sitting on the throne. And it says this in verse 8, When he had taken it, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Well, the Greek word for harp there is that same word we talked about a moment ago, kitara. So if David was playing uh, musical instruments today, he would probably be picking up a guitar. There is a second instrument, however, is mentioned here in verse 2, in the second half of the verse, and it is the ten-stringed lyre. The Hebrew word for lyre here is nebel. It is clear that David also could play the nebel in addition to the kinor. In Amos chapter 6, verse 5, you strum away on your harps, your nebel, 
like David and improvise on musical instruments. So it was believed that David played not only the kinnor, but the neville. They're obviously both stringed instruments. And according to ancient Jewish resources, the strings of the neville were made out of a sheep's large intestine, whereas the strings of the kinnor were made out of the sheep's small intestine. So uh, the kinnor is the smaller and higher pitched instrument of the two, and the, the nebel carries more of the bass tones. And, you know, in a, in a wor modern worship set setting today, um, that fits pretty well with what you see on, in many uh, worship bands is there's a guitar player and a bass player. I could paraphrase in modern language today, if David was saying this, he might say something more like, praise the Lord with the guitar, make music to him on the bass. But that's not really the really important thing about verses 1 to 3. I love what it says in verse 3. Sing to him a new song. This idea of singing a new song is first introduced here in this psalm. The idea of, of singing a new song is, is found uh, again in the Psalms. We'll, we'll come to it if we continue on in the Psalms. But it goes all the way through until you get to the, the New Testament. In fact, uh, in Revelation chapter 5, uh, verse 9, there is mention made of that new, that new song. The elders who have the harps or the guitars, well, they are holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. But then in verse 9, they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased men from God, from every tribe and language and people and nation. So this was a, a new song that they were singing, um, a new kind of song. And in Psalm 33, 3, we are first, for the first time, told to sing to God a new song. Now, we're going to just sit on that a little bit about what this means by a new song. Because, you know, it's the thing that is interesting is that, to me, that is that music has always been a controversial thing in the church. It was so controversial in the early church that, in many cases, there was no musical instruments permitted at all. The thing is that uh, this controversy about music has continued through the centuries. Whenever there have been new generations of worshipers, they brought in their own music uh, background and, and tastes and have tried to make new, bring, up, bring new ways to worship the Lord. And sometimes that has created difficulties for people and caused fights and division, and that's really unfortunate. But that's kind of driven by the, the tension between the, the gospel in its freshness in a generation, as opposed to the, the tradition that we've go, grown to love. And sometimes the traditions that people grow to love come into conflict with the new way of worship that might come about in, in any generation where people are coming to know Jesus Christ. This is a part of being human beings, I believe, and it's, it's an area where we can exercise tolerance for one another and try to be understanding and make room for everyone. In verse 3, where it says, Sing to him a new song, the Passion Translation says, Compose new melodies that release new praises to the Lord. Play his praises on instruments with the anointing and skill he gives you. Sing and shout with passion. Make a spectacular sound of joy. I would say that the new song that is talked about here isn't necessarily a brand new song. That is an unknown song. But it could be. No matter what we sing, no matter what the songs are that we, we bring to the table, we should sing them as though they are new songs to us. That is, in our spirit, we should 
worship like we've never worshiped before. We should be freshly falling in love with the Lord again and again and sing like we've never sung before. We should keep our worship fresh because worship is not a ritual of the dying, but a celebration of the, of the living. There's a call here to be invested in our worship, to worship with all the love that's in our heart, to, to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to worship the Lord in the same way. It's a call to be emotionally invested in our worship. Sing to him a new song. The same word that is that is the behind the Hebrew word for new here uh, does, does refer to new things, but it also refers to other things that are not exactly new. And if, for example, Job, Job chapter 29, verse 20 says, my glory will remain fresh in me, the bow ever new in my hand. Well, that glory that's described there in verse, chapter 29, verse 20, remaining fresh, well, that's that word new that we use here in Psalm 33, verse 3. Sing to the Lord, uh, sing to the Lord a fresh song. Sing in a, a fresh way to him. But there's no doubt, Etta, as well, that, that uh, this word new is, is, is about new things as well. Um, in Exodus 1, verse 8, it speaks about a new king who did not know about Joseph, who came to power in Egypt. Well, that's the same word that we use for a new song. Deuteronomy 22, verse 8, talks about when you build a new house to make a parapet around your roof so that nobody falls off if they're up there on the roof. Uh, Joshua 9, verse 13, um, talks about new wineskins, uh, but who, which had become now old, and uh, see how cracked they are, says the uh, uh, people in that, in that verse. Uh, Judges 16, verse 11, Samson, uh, first uh, he lied to Delilah by saying that if anyone ties me securely with new ropes that have never been used, I'll become as weak as any other man. And then uh, in transporting the Ark of the Covenant, um, the advice was given in 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 7. Now then get a new cart ready with two cows that have calved and have never been yoked. Hitch the cows to the cart, but take their calves away and pen them up. It's a brand new cart that's not been used before. Well, so these are all new things, and it all use, they all use that same word that we have here in uh, sing, sing to Him a New Song. But even more thrilling it should be to us is to think about the new song in terms of the new thing that God is doing and has been doing for all these centuries. He's doing His work. He's fulfilling His plan and purpose in this world. And uh, the plan of salvation has been going forth. He sent Jesus into the world, who died and gave his life, rose again, ascended to heaven, poured forth the Holy Spirit. And now the work of proclaiming the gospel goes on throughout the whole world and continues to this day. And we look forward to the, to the return of Jesus Christ to set up the kingdom of God on earth. Well, all of this is predicted by the prophets and in Isaiah, the, the prophet, in chapter 43, verse 19, the Lord says through him, See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. And continuing on to see that God is doing something new and, and bringing about renewal of the old. And Isaiah also says later on in chapter 65, 17, Behold, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. All of these verses have the same word for new that is behind our verse in Psalm 33, verse 3. 
Uh, it, it goes on from there to some that come a little more close, close to home for us. Jeremiah the prophet predicted the new covenant and he said, the time is coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And as, as people who are not Jewish, we've gotten, we've gotten the privilege of being able to be partakers of that new covenant that Jesus established by his death on the cross for us. Ezekiel promises uh, some new things as a result of the, what goes on with that new covenant where he says in, in uh, verse 26 of chapter 36, I will give you a new heart and put it, a new spirit in you. I'll remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, speaking poetically. But you see there's newness here. And all of these new things re related to God's work of salvation and creating a new people, a new heaven and a new earth, a new kingdom of God on earth. These are the reasons why we should sing a new song. We should have fresh worship and be excited about what God is doing in us and through us to the world around us.